Listen a little bit to the word of faith so that the word of faith would produce within you its power. I want you to listen to the things that the living God has to say for anybody that has ears to hear. You know, the Lord showed forth his glory and came down, began to dwell in the midst of men in a way that he had not since the day that Adam sinned and turned his back upon the living God. And Father had to cast man out of his presence because everything about man had become opposite of who he was. There was no connection. There was no way to make any kind of connection. There was no way for God to make connection with man. No way for men to make connection with God. Because a Adam joined leagues with the power of the darkness. And Father, praise God, had some men who laid hold upon him and took hold of the things of the Spirit by faith, even one of Adam's own sons, Abel. Then there Enoch, sixth, seventh from Adam, had a walk with God, such a beautiful walk with God that, I mean, my goodness, the Scripture says he was taken and, and up into heaven because he pleased the Father. I mean, that's, that is an amazing kind of a life to live in pleasing the Father. And, of course, God separated Abraham unto himself, and there was a personal relationship going on between God and Abraham. So he said he would be known by the, the everlasting name uh, uh, just being called the God of Abraham. <laughs> that, was, that is an amazing statement on it in itself. Father wants to have a relationship with you in such a way that all men may come to know him through the relationship that you have with him. God's made a way for this to be a living reality. But, you know, when the glory of God came down and dwelt in the midst of Israel, most of the people were, in, were not really interested. They were interested in being set free from slavery. They were interested in having a better quality of life. They were interested in earthly and sensual things, but really not very even, and really not interested too much in him. It became obvious. They had their eyes more on what Moses was doing rather than on the glory of God. They didn't know anything about God. They saw, his, they saw his deeds and his acts, but they didn't know his ways. If they would have known who Father was, my goodness gracious, they would have been concerned down there wondering if Moses was dead now. Perhaps he stood in the presence of God and God killed him. All they had was a, a concepts of the gods that men's imagination had created. Gods that demons had, had uh, uh, basically inspired and created. God came down in the glory of Israel and the beauty and his splendor. The fire of his presence filled the sanctuary that he designed and told Adam, I mean, forgive me, told Moses to put up in the wilderness. There's only one guy really interested. His name was Joshua. And of all those people, only one person. And then, and then said, what are you interested in? Huh. Isn't that sad? One guy. Of course, Moses was interested. But, and, and of, course, uh, you know, of course, Aaron was interested. Aaron was anointed to minister before the presence of the Lord. But there was a person interested in the glory of God that just stepped out, as it were, out of the company of the people. His name was Joshua. Scripture says he did not depart from the door of the tent. Hallelujah. I mean, he was captivated by the presence of the Lord. Father, his purpose to show forth his power and his glory in the midst of his people. He started showing that very early on. And never has it been so true as it is today, now that God has raised up for himself a glorious church, which is to be the fullness of Christ Jesus made manifest. But I can look at what God's purpose was in, in revealing his glory and his splendor to the nations of the earth because he wants people to know who he is. He's, he's, a, God of, he's a God of loving kindness and God of tender mercies. <laughs> when, 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 when Moses earnestly inquired of God so that God would reveal himself and show uh, who he was, he said, I'm the one who's compassionate. I'm the one who's merciful. I'm the one who's showing loving kindness and forgiveness. I mean, that's his name, you know. Amazing God. That's what he wants to show to the nations of the earth. And he was going to show these things through more than just an announcement of, 
of somebody going and saying, well, you know, they saw God and telling the story about what happened when they encountered him. He actually wanted his manifest presence and his power to be revealed in the midst of his covenant people, which we saw take place when Israel was walking right with God. And you know, when Jesus shows up in the day that suddenly the messenger came to the temple, he shows up. You can see where he was at, where Christ Jesus' heart was at when he saw the people of Israel taking Father's house, a place that was supposed to contain his manifest glory. Now, now you know, I lose, use that word loosely when I say contain. A place where his manifest glory was supposed to be revealed to the nations of the earth. And Jesus is seeing their tradition going on and their religion going on. Look at how, look at how he acted. Look at how he acted. Just look at how he acted. I mean, he was so distraught. And as the word of God says, the scripture says, the zeal of the Lord had eaten him up, consumed him. His, will, his, his zeal for the Father. He knew about the glory. He knew how wonderful it was, the majesty, the splendor of it, how it would be the healing to the nations. It would be the re remedy to every person who lived under a sin curse, who lived under the power of oppression and torment and disease and sickness. And all they did is they turned it into a man-made thing filled with the traditions of men. And the glory of the Lord had long departed. Jesus took a whip and he drove them out. I've often wondered and thought about how, what is the response of the Lord Jesus to much of the activity that goes on in the church today. Listen, people, you don't have to go far to find other ministers that disagree with me. There is a whole company of them out there. And that is, a, that is neither here nor there. The question is, who agrees with God? Who's grabbed a hold of the passion of those things that God has revealed about himself through Jesus Christ, that he's revealed about himself in the word. Who's grabbed a hold of a passion to so seek the Lord until his power and his glory is manifested as he's described it in his word that it's supposed to be made manifest. I'm going to read a couple of verses of scripture to you, not what I was intended, not even what I advertised tonight, <laughs> earlier today. And who knows, you know, the Lord gives me liberty. I may be weaving some of the other things that the Lord has shown me into this. I'm sure I will. It's just the way it works. <laughs> the Lord has messed up every outline that I've ever made. <laughs> He's taken every three-point sermon that I've ever had and made one gigantic point. You know. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, in Romans chapter 8, we read that, we read this, verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails and is in pain together until now. This is Paul writing by the Holy Ghost. Have you noticed that? Have you looked out there and seen demon-possessed people, people that are afflicted and tormented with sickness and disease? Have you looked out there and seen people with sorrow and sadness when God's got for them the oil of joy and the garment of praise? Have you seen people living in strife and envy, hating one another, having critical things to say? I say to this to you right now. You want to take a hold of the ways of God? Then keep your tongue from evil and your lips that they speak no guile. Depart from evil and pursue peace. I understand God's number one description of evil or people is people who are not walking in a love relationship with one another. That's how God defines evil there in that verse in Psalms 34 because he says depart from evil and pursue peace and he's talking about relationship the whole the whole verse of scripture whole passage is about how people interact with each other it says for his ears are open unto the righteous he hears their prayers but his face is against them to do wicked to cut them off You and I, we the remedy to this situation that we're seeing here. <laughs> yeah.
You and I, we're supposed to be the light that shines in a dark world. We're supposed to be the one who has the ability to cast out the devil when a devil manifests. We're supposed to be the one that brings peace to the mind that is tormented with mental disease and mental illness. We're the ones who's supposed to bring that wonderful life of God to those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. We are the river of the living God that flow, out of our being flows the rivers of the living God that is satisfies a dry and thirsty land. We the healing to the nations. Jesus made us so. We, people want to try to define their ministry apart from Jesus. You cannot. And listen, the things that I'm going to say tonight, you're going to have to understand. This is what God has done for us in his love. He's made us one with him. I hear people all the time trying to somehow reduce this wonderful great salvation to something that man can do out of human effort. Christ Jesus has brought us into his ministry and it's his ministry that we're supposed to live in and abide in. A ministry that it cannot be confined to an earthly realm. It's a ministry that, that, of the Son, Christ Jesus, speaking out of heaven. Functioning out of heaven. Interacting with everything that belongs to the realm of heaven. So he said to Nathaniel, <laughs> you used to see these angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's why you see that interaction with him and the Father is such that he always saw the Father before him and on his right hand that he should not be moved. God has brought us into the same ministry, not into a different ministry. <laughs> and... and <laughs> Ha. The only way that that's possible is that, you, that we under, begin to understand the dynamics of how to live the light that is consecrated to doing the will of the Father and depending upon the Lord Jesus Christ to do the work through our life. To where that really it isn't about you and me anymore. We want to talk about what they've done, what they've achieved and what they can be. It really has nothing to do with you and me. It has everything to do with him, and he's invited us to come and abide in him. And that is amazing. That is amazing. You know, the prophet Isaiah said that we would go, we would be led forth with joy. We would go out with joy and be led forth in peace. And the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the mountains and the hills should break forth in the singing. Before us. Think about it. See, he said, the redeemed of the Lord return and come with singing into Zion. And everlasting joy is on their head. They have obtained gladness and joy. <laughs> and sorrow and sighing has fled away. And therefore we go out with joy. We're led forth when we leave. In this place of assembly. The place of the church. The place that the Lord Jesus Christ set up. For you to be perfected and built up. The place where he baptized in his Holy Ghost and power. In such a way that Jesus would fully be manifested. And there placed within the midst of the church. All of the resources so that you can have a prophet. <laughs> Hope you're managing your resources properly. Hope you're making the most of that which God has provided for you in Christ Jesus. Because tonight the Holy Ghost is here to be manifested in every person's life. That's the will of the Father. But you're going to have to be willing to step out and, and begin to cooperate with Him. And, and you're going to be willing to, to, to hunger and thirst after these things that belong to the realm of heaven. If it's going to be a reality in your, it's going to be a reality in your life. When you're hungry and thirsty and passionate about it, nobody can keep you quiet. Ain't nobody can intimidate you. Ain't nobody can shut you down. Nobody's been able to shut me down. Many people have tried. For many years. And nobody shut me down. Why? Because it's a glory on the inside of me. It's a river flowing out of me. It's a fire set up in my bones. My goodness. Come on. Is that, talking about all the time I didn't have an opportunity. I didn't have an opportunity either. I took one. <laughs> Hallelujah. I ran with the thing, man. I said, this is the greatest thing that has ever happened to humanity. I'm a part of the greatest event that is on the, on the records of history. The greatest of things in the universe. And I can feel it. Think about it. Think about what it looks like for, for, for the mountains to break forth in the singing and all the hills to clap their hands. That's a big contrast to all creation groaning and travail until now. In verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. 
Even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption to with the redemption of the body. Now, I just want to simply say something about this. I want to say, I want to put it into context to some degree that, that you can grab a hold of it because this is beyond anything you can relate to. Let me just say that right now. Can I just clear the air? It's beyond anything you can relate to. It goes right along with what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where he said he was groaning to put off this earthly tabernacle because he know, knew that he had, that if this earthly tabernacle should be dissolved, he has one in the heavens. He has a heavenly tabernacle, one that was made and prepared by the Lord Jesus, one that God had waiting for him. Now understand this. I'm, I know that Paul visited the realms of heaven and once you step over into that realm you do not want to come back into this realm you don't want anything to do with this realm really huh that's why Paul said I am in straight between two between two choices uh, to depart and be with the Lord is far better that's what I want Okay, but to stay here in the body is needful for you. So I'm going to go ahead and stay here. And so within the framework of that, he's talking about now he's talking about we ourselves groaning to be rid of the constraints that we have in that is holding us back from the privilege of being able to fully interact with everything that father has. But I'm going to tell you, listen, there's a whole lot for us to have up to that point. There is joy unspeakable. There is a glory of heaven. There is a power of the, of the an authority of the Holy Ghost to be manifested in our life that when we interact with people, they can experience the very love of God. They can know a love that passes the love that they've understood for their children, for their spouse. They can know a peace that passes understanding, a joy that is unspeakable. You and I are going to have to understand that there is a need for us to hook up with that which the Holy Ghost is doing so there can be a greater expression of that which he has for us through our lives. I'm certain that Joshua standing there beholding the glory of God continued to enlarge his heart to give him a capacity to be able to receive what Moses was going to transfer to him because Moses got to stand there and behold the glory face to face. He beheld the glory face to face. He saw the glory in the midst of the... He saw the glory in the midst of... The bush that God chose to stand in, which is a very interesting thing. I mean, there's really not very much at all that you can figure logically out about the Bible. It's just because it's all supernatural. It all belongs into another realm or the whole new set of principles. It is a divine realm, a supernatural realm, an eternal realm which God dwells. And Father chose to stand there in the midst of the bush, in the midst of his, uh, what I call his overcoat, which is a fiery cloud. That's his garment. That's his overcoat. And Moses was able to look in the midst of that fire and see the face of God standing there. Hallelujah. And then the Lord took him there to another place where the glory of the Father passed before him. And he saw him. He saw him. He saw him as a, a man sees a man. <laughs> and Joshua got to stand there and look at the glory upon the tabernacle, upon the temple in the wilderness, till one day Moses laid his hands on him. Then he went out with such authority that he commanded the sun and the moon to stand still. Now listen to me. Listen, I hear a lot of people write a lot of books about all the statistics and facts and geographical information concerning those things that took place in the life of Joshua. Come on, let's stop and think a minute, a minute about how God changed the entire laws of the universe at the command of one man to suit the purposes of one man because the man was doing the purposes of the Father on the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And who is doing that work? Tell me who is doing that work. He was father that was doing that work. He was father that was doing that work. In the name of Jesus. 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 Right now. In the name of Jesus. 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 Baby's not used to sitting in church. She's been living up in Santa Cruz. Right now she's going to get used to sitting in church. Hallelujah. You guys just going to have to come down more often. No, I, it's my desire 
that Holy Ghost churches be all over San Diego, be all over L.A., Southern California, be all up and down the coast of, of California, be all throughout the United States of America. The reality of it is, is that's not the case. It's not the case. There's a bunch of religious churches. And I'm telling you, dear people, you, uh, there are so many, I mean, my goodness gracious, there's so many people who'd rather be in a religious church anyways. I don't want to be around the Holy Ghost. I don't want to be down around the power of God because there's just a few people, it seems, that even want the things of heaven that are going to press in because the reality of it is is these things are supplied to anybody who wants them. They're available to anyone who wants them and very few people have them. Therefore, very few people want them. Huh? Just one little bit. Just give me a little bit. Just one little bit. No, we don't want you to have a little bit. God wants you to have all the fullness of his power and of his presence in your life. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. No. I want to just turn you to the verse of scripture here in 1 John. I'm going to have to go slow tonight because I'm going to lay some heavy on you. I'm going to go slow tonight because I'm going to lay some heavy things on you. I'm expecting you to believe that what I'm expecting you to begin to believe what God is doing, the works that Father is doing so that you'll do them with him. And those of you who, are, who know the Lord, you don't need anybody to lay hands on you. Huh? Because you have all of the resources of heaven that you need to walk in divine health. But if you're going to walk in divine health, you're going to have to keep your tongue from evil and your lips to speak no guile. Because all you can do is bring upon yourself sickness and disease. It's true. It's true. And I don't want to get too much into that because people get all freaked out. They get all weird. Even weirder. Huh? I want to talk to you about the blessings of God and the promises of God. I'm going to tell you right now, there's a heaven for you to gain and there's a hell for you to shun, both in this life and in the consequences of the decision you make now and also in the future. I'm going to tell you right now that the wages of sin is death. I'm going to tell you that the gift of God is eternal life. I'm going to tell you that if you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption and that stinks and that hurts and that's painful and that's, and that's misery and that's everything you don't want. But if you sow to the things of the Spirit, you shall of the Spirit reap everything that belongs to a, a, an eternal realm, a realm of the very life of God. We call it the eternal life. Hallelujah. Because it's God kind of life. It's the life that Jesus showed us. It's the life that Jesus has. It's the life that Father has. It's the life that the Holy Ghost has. It's the life that's come, God's come to communicate to us. And when you grab a hold of it, it's power and authority over everything that Satan is doing against you fundamentally and everything that God wants to do through you. <laughs> And, I mean, goodness, Satan has purposed that it, 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 even if you are doing and moving and functioning and the things of God that you have hooked up with the divine grace, he wants to come along and invalidate you so he can profane the name of Jesus. Now, or he wants to stop you from ever getting there because, once again, he wants to invalidate those things which God said in his word. And somebody's going to have to have a zeal for God realizes what this temple is all about, what this new creation is all about, what this purchased possession is all about that has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and filled with the glory of heaven called the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then to start glorifying God in your body and your spirit, which are his. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the living God. Not getting another prayer line to be saved. Not getting another prayer line to be sure. My goodness, if you need to be sure, I mean, goodness, at some point in time, you need to be sure. And if it takes you till you're 90 years old, still getting in the prayer lines to be sure, then God bless your heart. Go ahead and do it. But come on, when is, when is, he going, when is the event of holding forth a good confession? When is the event of taking a hold of the things which God said is yours and, and making them more important to you than anything else so that they become a reality in your life? And, and if it's not, if these things are not a reality in your life, it's because you're mixing them with things and God's been trying to show you the mixture and you've not paying attention. But goodness, the good thing is God's full of loving kindness and tender mercies. He's very long-suffering and patient. And he'll just try to show you again. Amen. Amen. Isn't that good? Amen. He don't give up. He don't give up. When men would faint, he don't give up. When men are worn out, I'm tired. He don't give up. He's still standing there holding forth the words of life. Beckoning us to come. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> 
I'm telling you, dear people, God has purposed for you and I to go everywhere, not based upon any works of righteousness which we have done, but because we've accepted and received this relationship provided through for us through the only begotten Son, declaring all the words of this life, showing forth His work of faith with power, declaring all those things which God is right now doing in heaven, showing that Satan is completely destroyed, His power is completely invalidated, that we, through Christ Jesus, Jesus have authority over everything that belongs to the realm of sin and sickness and disease. When will it begin on another level of consecration? Hallelujah. When will it begin with another passion? Oh, you know, I could stand here and I could say, I could tell you about all of the miracles that happened in our lives in the last 40 days. All the miracles that we saw take place in Nepal, the things that God did in South Korea, the things that God did in Japan. I can tell you right now, all that did was make me hungry to have more of the things that God says he wants to have in his word right here, right now in this place. I'm not going to say, oh, you should have been there. I'm going to say, look, we want God to be here right now. There's a passion in my soul to let my life be reconciled with those things that God described in his word. And that's what you're going to hear from me. I'm going to preach what's on the inside of me. Amen. I'm going to declare to you. You go, you listen to a preacher, he's going to declare to you the things that are on the inside of him that God's made real to him. He's going to just talk to you about sometimes, a lot of times people minister out of their problems, out of their own issues, out of their own struggles. <laughs> I'm telling you my struggle right now, okay? <laughs> I'm being transparent before you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to hold on all these things that God has for us. I want to live that life that Jesus purchased for me at Calvary, not because of anything that I did, not because I deserved it, not because that I I earned it, but because he loved me so much, he extended to me all of his good favor, and he called me to come on in and have a place around his throne room, around his table of the mighty, totally undeserving, didn't have any right to be there. He said, come on in. I'm not going to stand outside. I'm taking my place. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not giving up my seat. I'm not giving up my seat. So I said, the, the meeting's over. You can go ahead and go take the rest. I'm staying right here. No, 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 no. You, you can still come back in tomorrow. No, I'm staying here. I'm not moving. I'm not giving up my chair. I'm claiming this place. Hallelujah. I'm not departing from this. I'm never going out anymore. Wherever Stalam goes, I'm going to follow him. So I said, well, that, that just belongs to just a small company of people. I'm in that company. Amen. No, you got to be Jew. No, I don't. I'm in that company. I can lay hold on it. I'm going wherever the lamb goes. Wherever he goes, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to be right there with him. You can be wherever else you want to be. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be with him. You know, I've laid hold. I've, I, I desire to be at the right hand or the left hand. I want to be right there at the... I want to be right... Man, if I'm not at the right hand or the left hand, I'll be one of, I want to be on the right hand of the right hand. Or the left hand of the left hand. Or it doesn't matter, but I want to be somewhere right up there. Right very close. Not in the nosebleed section. Not in some other nation. Not in some, you know, 20,000 miles away location. I'll be right there. Beholding him. Looking at everything he does. Watching every movie he makes. Come on now, people. You don't like this kind of preaching, you'll never like me. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to get so, I wanna, I'm, I'm so hungry and, and I want to be more hungry than I've ever been. I'm so thirsty. I want to be more thirsty than I've ever been. I want the outpouring of God. To, oh power and the manifestation of every wonderful glorious thing that he's doing I want that more than anything else and that's all I'm going to talk about and that's all I'm going to live for and everything that I could possibly detect that could potentially mess with that or hinder that or run interference I'm going to make war against it man I'm going to win amen. amen hallelujah praise God praise God hallelujah <laughs> sickness and disease defiles that glory that he's purposed for us to have Somebody said, oh, don't say that. Somebody's going to be hurt because they're sick. You feelings need to be hurt. Now rise up in that place, quit feeling sorry for yourself, and declare the word of God be healed in Jesus' name. Because Jesus paid for your, for your healing in full. That is amazing to me how many people do not believe <laughs> that the healing of sickness and disease is in the redemption covenant when he bore our sins in his own body and by his stripes we are healed and you find that you find forgiveness of sin and you find healing of disease in every verse of scripture it talks about forgiveness of sin redemption salvation my God what's wrong with you man what Bible are you reading what, what happened what devastation what, what terrible event took place in your life that caused you to deny the faith and change the word of God you're listening to me now I know you are 
There's, you, you'd be amazed people would tune me in just to pray that somehow God would shut me down. <laughs> I tell you right now, let me just tell you, let me help you out right now. I've discovered those prayers always backfire on the person that's praying them. Haman's noose only works around his neck. He had it designed specially made for Mordecai, but Mordecai never saw that day. Amen. And I pray you repent right now and get right in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, one night, one night, I just tell you, it's the way the Lord does it for me. You know, you saw I'm very calm. I've never run in church up until this one night. And this one night, when people were, they, 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 they were, they were tuning in to get some verification of how off I was. You need to get some verification if I was even possibly tolerable. And that night, the parent God came on me. I started running around the place, man. I was jumping and shouting. I mean, goodness gracious. <laughs> they got all the information they needed. They, got, they were fully loaded with all of the data and all the facts. All they had to do was hit record, play. Or record and then play it later or whatever, you know. He goes, now look at the man. He's totally crazy, completely out of his mind. Yeah, I, was, I enjoyed being out of my mind that night. I enjoyed being raptured in rejoicing and fellowship with God more than I could contain. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, I, I'm telling you, I'm happy to bear the reproach, whatever that looks like. Listen, the, the reason that they're, they're the, the primary reason that, 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 that the religious people hated Jesus was because of the miracles, which he did. Because all they wanted to do is sit around and compare knowledge one with another. And they prided themselves in being able to give an argument that could not be overthrown. Here Jesus doesn't argue at all, just commands the dead to raise to life again. <laughs> the boy, those are born blind to see. Let that be the message. The deaf to hear, the crippled to walk. The oppressed go free. That's his doctrine. That is the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the doctrine that is distilled upon the pages of this book. Hallelujah. Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. God's got one miracle after the next, after the next, after the next, after the next for you and me in this life. And it's going to cultivate, cult, uh, 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 it's going to uh, ultimately uh, result in you and I being changed in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye if we're here when the trump sounds when he comes with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God. People want to make that at the end of the book of Revelation. I didn't see Jesus come at the book of the end of, at the end of the book of Revelation with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God. I didn't see that. I didn't see that. <laughs> and I'm with an total and one ever sin agreement with my wife. <laughs> Hallelujah. Changed in a moment in twinkling of an eye. Furthermore, if you and I should just tonight, if we should die before we wake. If we should not see another day. We know that we have a tabernacle prepared of God. A heavenly tabernacle prepared of God. That we'll step right into while we await the resurrection of the body. There's some glorious things. One miracle after the next, after the next, after the next, after the next. <laughs> culminating in this great and glorious event. Hallelujah. Let me read 1 John 3 to you. Hallelujah. Whew. Look at this. Woo. Behold. What manner of love the Father has poured out, bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. You look back and real quickly just hold your finger on that with me for just a moment and turn back in the pages of your Bible to the Gospel of John in chapter 1 and look there in verse 12 and look at what the Lord uh, it describes to us right at the very beginning of this covenant, the moment that you step into this wonderful grace that God has provided for us through Jesus Christ. He says, as many as received him, as many as received Jesus Christ to be the one whom he described himself to be, 
to be God the Word incarnated in the flesh for one purpose, to go to the cross and bear your sins so that you might go free from the sin condition so that Satan would have no more power over you so that everything that breached relationship between you and God should be removed and you should step into a oneness with the Almighty so that now you would know God, He would know you, you would live in Him and He would live in you. What a great grace that God has given us. Many would receive Jesus for who He is and who He was. To them he gave power to become the sons of God, to be the sons of God, even them that believed on him. Back to 1 John chapter 3. Oh, what love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when, we sh- when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Think of this wonderful grace of God that has brought us into such relationship. That has brought us into such oneness. And it has brought us into such union. God has brought us into a place now that all of our identity should be drawn from who Christ Jesus is and not from who we are. All of our purpose in life should be, should be defined for us by those things that Father has willed for our life and not what men have designed for us. You've been educated all of your life from the time you arrived on the scene and described by your parents who you are and what you're going to be and what you should want and what you should do. Then the education system came along and, and then really brought that into force, com- rewriting for you a definition of your life according to the will of man. And many people have bought in on that to the point they can't even hear the Word of God. You've got to be completely re-educated. There's so much doubt and unbelief within the intellectual community. I know that A.A. Allen received a great power from God to be able to cast out devils. And that was manifested in his life, especially early on in his ministry. And early on in his ministry, he saw a demon manifested. And he described this demon of intellectualism. That was manifested, and he described it on a, on a, on a, in a realm that was so close to satanic power, such a place of deception, there was no reaching in to that place of the, for the, to deliver those who were imprisoned by it. That's pretty radical. Because they convinced themselves that they know everything about the world and that God doesn't exist. It's where it ultimately goes. We see that in an academic community. And then ultimately it tears down our understanding of the realms in which uh, God moves and ministers out of. Because now we've got an explanation for every disease. We've got an explanation for every sickness. We've got an explanation for every trouble, for every problem. And, and, the, and we so, suddenly somehow figure that we've got an answer supplied for us within the framework of that which man can do. What deception. They run interference. <laughs> now I'm telling you tonight, I'm going after this thing. I'm just going to, I'm going to go after it. I, I mean, I just feel that the Spirit of the Lord just, when he, when he sent me, when I came back to the United States of America, coming back from Japan, I just set, 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 felt such a authority called fire down upon the church to see all these things that, that, are, that are man-made, all these things that belong to doubt and unbelief, all these things that belong to humanism and intellectualism burned up so they no longer have power to work its craft, literally, and I'm using the word right, craft in the midst of His church. I want you to turn with me to uh, John chapter 5 now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, before you do that, okay, let me just show you, because I just I want to just trace the sonship for just a minute, okay? <laughs> Can I trace the sonship for just a minute? Go to Galatians chapter 4 real quickly. Just want to trace the sonship for you. And, and I, I want you to understand, nobody's going to earn this. You just receive it. <laughs> sometimes, more pe- sometimes people do more with these things in the first week of salvation than they do after 10 years. Huh? Come on now. You got to be simple with these things and believe it and receive it for what God has done for us. Out of His own grace and out of His own power and out of His own mercy, He's provided these wonderful things for us. And somehow we get ourselves in the equation and then it, it begins to, 
you know, bad experiences or whatever it is. I don't know what it is. I have never had any bad experiences that turned me away from faith. Huh? I know what the problem is, man. I mean, you're supposed to be, people are supposed to be kept by the same power of God as I've been kept by. I don't know what the problem is. It's good the experiences in God work, work hope, huh? Work confidence, better said. And confidence doesn't, we're not going to be made ashamed. Our confidence isn't going to be shamed. Well, look, he had confidence and it didn't work. Look, he had confidence he was going to be able to do it. And look, he failed miserably. He had confidence that the business was going to go and it crashed and burned. He had confidence that he could do 10 push-ups. He barely got through one. You know, confidence is made ashamed. Huh? He thought he could run the race and he fell down in the first five feet. Uh, confidence is not made ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is poured, poured in our heart by the Holy Ghost, which he's given unto us. Amen. Well, let me remind you that we've got some people on the web right now, and what they do is they take all the verses of Scripture that I quote or that I refer to, and, they, and, they, and they, they write them down, and then all they reference those verses of Scripture to other verses of Scripture in the Bible, and then they put graphic pictures up so you can see how many I quoted out of the Old Testament, how many I quoted out of the prophets, how many I quoted out of the law, how many I quoted out of the New Testament and the epistles. I mean, you get a whole breakdown, okay? And, and then they, they send it out by Twitter, and you can get on that list. And uh, in, in fact, that's one reason you can use Twitter in the meeting, okay? So that you can be referencing on the verses of Scripture. And thank you for doing that. We just pray to God uh, that that resource is provided. And we pray that there be people who hunger and thirst for the resource. Because I've discovered that people know more about the doctrines of men than they know about the doctrine of God. I discovered that long ago. And it's the doctrine of God that's going to make the difference. And the doctrine of God is revealed to us through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, not by any other means. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the doctrine of God has been personified. Amen. In, for, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 7, the scripture says, Wherefore you are no more a servant, but you are a son. Say, I'm not a servant. I'm, not a, servant. I'm a son. I'm, a son. I'm not just a servant in Father's house. I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a servant in Father's house because I'm not a child in Father's house. I'm a matured son, and it's talking about matured sons right here. And we are instantaneously given the place and position as matured sons as soon as we step into the kingdom of God. Your growth rate is totally dependent upon your willingness to obey God. Your willingness to, grow, to, to, be, to grow into the maturity of the ministry of Jesus depends on your willingness to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning I talked about the man that they called the Apostle of, the, of, of Nepal. They wrote a book about him subtitled, A Man Great as the Himalayas. Because what God did through his life. He was 27 years old in an elite uh, military unit in the British Army that comes from Nepal. 27 years old, he was a major. And he turned in his resignation once he found Jesus. He found Jesus because, he, Jesus found him rather. <laughs> he, 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 he was introduced to Jesus because a couple of people were willing to go out in, into a marketplace and set up for a little meeting. They didn't have to have a thousand. They didn't have to have 10,000 to go. They went out there and they were just having a little meeting with their Bible open and, 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 and preaching a five-minute sermon, doing a little bit of music as people was passing by. He happened to be one of those people that were passing by. And he turned the nation of Nepal upside down. Huh? He, he, he heard that there was a person who could give him forgiveness of sin. He, he turns in his resignation because the Lord said, I want you to go and become a mission uh, and, and go and tell your people in the nation of Nepal uh, who I am. Now, he, as, he turns in his, 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 as he turns in his resignation, the, the, his commanding, uh, the commanding general of, of, of his unit said, look, you of all people have a great opportunity here and great promise for rapid promotion. Don't do this. He said, no, I've been called to go and follow Jesus. Think about this. He leaves a lush, I mean, just amazing, lucrative job and lush position where he has everything that he could ever want in the material world. Now, to go and live in Nepal and go and stay in people's barns because Hindus would not allow anybody like him in their house because they would offend their gods in their house. So he has to, live, he has to stay out in the barns. He goes, he gets arrested. He goes from one prison sentence to the next prison sentence to the next prison sentence. They put him in with dead people so because they want to try to teach him a lesson because everybody he put some, everybody that they put him in prison with, everybody gets saved. Because of the power and the authority of God. So they put him for six months with dead people. 
and they figured that he would be dead after two weeks. This is the life that he chose to live. I'm telling you, you step out there, you abandon everything, you follow Jesus, you're going to get the Bible results. Your life will instantaneously be, be reconciled with the Word of God. Hallelujah. There's more nations to conquer, people. He didn't get the last one. Kashmir still unreached people group. Ha <laughs> ha. You gotta die, and go there. You gotta go to prison, man. You gotta go to prison. He would, he would here's how he do the altar. He would do the altar calls. And let people know that if you if you give your life to Jesus, you have to spend a year in prison. It's so long. And then he'd, he'd build them up in the faith and they'd just come anyways. And then he'd remind them, now you're gonna get baptized today. When you get baptized, they're surely get, you're surely gonna get arrested. And they would still come and get baptized. And then they'd be held, hauled off to prison. To go spend a year in prison. <laughs> oh my God. You know, when all of a sudden these things become a living reality to us and this becomes more important than anything else, a great change will take place in your life. Great, great change. Great change. I pray for great change tonight. Amen. Fully matured sons. Fully matured sons. The great signs and wonders of this man's life. Before he was a year old in Jesus. Commanding rain to come during drought. Huh? Commanding the weather and the weather obeying him. Seeing every, every miracle that Jesus saw. And he's only been saved for a couple of years. Huh? Maturity happens as quickly as you're willing to obey. As radically as you're willing to obey. You want, to have, you want to get a good model? Look at the 12 disciples. That's a good model. I would go with that model. You want a good model? Look at the Apostle Paul. Look at what happened with him. Look at how he obeyed God. Hallelujah. Ha, ha, ha. Praise the name of Jesus. Huh? I mean, we just said Joshua off to UC Santa Cruz, get a doctor's degree in ministry so he can get all snared and hung up in academia and snared all hung up and pursuing some career, we sit them there to get polished, to get launched out into another level of the anointing, to go everywhere preaching the gospel. I'm telling you right now, there, I, I have, my, I have a, such a target in my heart set on the nation of Japan because the most unreached people group that I've ever, ever encountered, that nation, freedom, freedom uh, uh, there to preach the gospel. It's a republic, it's a democracy. And, and there, by and large, there are, no, there are very few Christians the churches, you go to Tokyo, 28 million people. 28 million people. 2,000 churches, average size, 30 people in the churches. And they are not Japanese. They're all the other nations that have come there. Benny Hinn goes there, spends all kinds of money trying to do a crusade. 2,000 people show up. Carlos Anaconda goes there, 1,500 people show up. I mean, the, 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 the Japanese are not even interested. <laughs> The Assemblies of God, the biggest denomination in that nation. And, and at, at best, they can gather 10,000 people in the Pentecostal movement there. And I could begin to describe similar things about San Diego. And right now, right now, the whole, the whole thing that is holding us up on the property are the police, the police department, the police the police of this city, this county, the whole thing's holding us up on getting the property. Because they're fighting to not, for us not to be on there. And every place that we've turned in this city, we've, we've encountered these things. But you know what? We just can, I'm, not, I'm not giving. I'm not stopping. I just want people to understand. We, look, quit being scattered by the lies of Satan. Quit being immobilized by the things that the powers of darkness are doing. Look, I'm telling you, we're going to take, we're going to rush on the city. We're going to climb up to the walls. Great is the army that carries out his word. Father is going to show forth his glory and power. It's just who's going to stand here and beseech him and lift up their voice and cry out to him so that he comes and does those things which only he can do. He comes and speaks with his voice to break off the strongholds that only he can break off. My heart's so filled with the needs that are going on in Japan, the needs that are going on 
in Korea, the needs that are going on in Nepal, the needs that are going on in China. My heart's filled with the needs that are going on in the Middle East, the places, the nations that the Lord sent us to. But my heart's so filled also with the needs of the city. And I know there's only one remedy. I know there's only one remedy. And the only one remedy is a glorious church. In fact, if it is, is the Lord gave me a plan to be able to go in to, to Japan and fill up the stadium because they love baseball. I mean, the baseball is the biggest thing. I grab a, and, and the second thing that they love more than that is golf. And, and we know Christian people that are in baseball and Christian people that are in go golf like Bubba Watson. And we just take them out there, man, we'll fill the place up. But then the biggest quandary is, where we, what, what church are we going to put them in? What church are we going to put them in? Where's, where, what church are we going to put them in then? And then I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a quandary here too. Huh? Come on now. And let's just go, let's begin to do this thing the way that God wants us to do it. And what he'll do then is he'll enlarge the place of our dwelling and he'll give us the insight on how to do it not only here but everywhere else. But as long as you hold on to your life, you're not going to get the life that God has for you. You get to choose your life or his life because you can't have them both. Now, what needs to do, what needs to happen is you need to have clearly defined for you the expressions of your life versus the expression of his life. And that's what I'm here to do tonight. That's what I'm here to talk to you about. And I'm going to lay hands on every person in this place. And I'm, I'm going to believe God for every person who's sick and diseased in their body to be instantly and totally healed right now. And then I want you to say it happened to you and go out shouting instead of having to wake up in the morning and say, my goodness, I got healed. And you have to find out about it tomorrow. Or, worse than that, power of God comes on you and touches you, and then you go, and, you, and the next day, you already healed. But you go, and the next day, Satan sets you up, and he's got somebody standing there already set to tell you to defy and redefine for you that you didn't get healed, and it's okay because God still loves you. And, it's, and he's given this to you so it's because he loves you. And, and, and you, 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 you're going through this trial because he, he whatever, I don't, I don't even understand. That's crazy logic. Over and again, over and again, over and again, we find ourselves in need of protecting those who are touched by the power of God, whether it's salvation or healing, to protect them from the religious people. Huh? I watched Jesus doing it too. He said, he's looking at his disciples, why are you talking to those nuts? Why are you talking to them? What is it that they got for you? What is the religious people got for you? What are they telling you? What are they doing? Where well, they were describing all these things, these religious people, see, they know, you know they're the experts. They know the Bible better than anybody else knows the Bible. They're the leaders. Blah, 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 blah. Huh? God's validated them. They got the biggest congregations, whatever. Right? This is the way it works. And what they were doing is they were running interference with the miracle so that the demon wouldn't, couldn't go out. The demon couldn't go out. They had the power and the authority. Jesus gave it to them to cast out the devil, but the demon couldn't go out because they were listening to the advice of these traditionalists that were robbing them of the faith and the power of God, rendering them in a place of unbelief. That's what happened. They were talking to these scribes and these Pharisees and, and, and getting advice from them because they were having a little bit of trouble with this devil that off came upon this young man and threw him into the water, threw him in the fire. Jesus broke up the thing, said, what on earth is going on here? Move out of the way. Satan, leave. Yeah. And, then, and, and the demon left. Went out of the boy. And the disciples came and Jesus said, well, why couldn't we cast him out? He says, because of your unbelief. <laughs> after, he, after he laid out, what are, you, what are you doing talking to these guys? Why are you listening to them? They're talking about how that the child was lunar struck. Because huh? back then, diseases were all in the stars. And the phase of the moon. And the cures were just about as weird. <laughs> and I'm not going to get down, I'm not going to get on that because I'll get off on a tangent here. And then I went to. Verse 7. You know more servants, but you sons. Look at this. And if you're sons, then you're heir of God. Now listen to that. You that don't want union with Christ Jesus. You that don't want the ministry of Jesus. You that believe that somehow if we start talking about we're functioning and flowing and the authority that Christ Jesus has given us, somehow we are doing violation against his position as God. That is so ridiculous. I want you to, every one of you to understand, there is no person who has a place and position that Jesus Christ has. God has given him a name above every name. That at his name, every knee should bow and every tongue should 
confess. He's been given a place that is above all principalities and powers and might and dominion. And we'll forever stand in his presence and cast our uh, crowns before his feet and say, and you alone belongs, uh, you alone are worthy. To you alone belongs all power and might and honor. You're the one who redeemed us. No one would ever want to, to, to try to uh, stand in the place, as it were, of Christ Jesus, of who he is. But he has caused you and I to come into oneness with him. And he's made us heirs and co-inheritors with Jesus. Read Romans eight seventeen. Get that. Understand that. Just turn your Bibles. I want you to read that before I take you on here. I want you to see this. I want you to understand. I want you to grab a hold of the recent book that I wrote called The Unlimited Authority of God. Because the unlimited authority, of, unlimited authority of God is the authority that has been given to the believer. It's the authority of the word. It's the authority of the spirit. It's the authority of the blood. It's the authority of his name. If we just stop there, my goodness, what authority? It's authority of sonship. It's the authority of faith. Come on now. I want you to get these things in you so that it becomes the expression of who you are. Satan will fight against it. Every, every naysayer, every gainsayer will rise up against it. Every demonic manifestation will come out against it. Because Satan has no power and authority to stop those who would believe in Christ Jesus. That's why Jesus said, if any man believe, if anyone believe on me, anyone believe on me, these works which I do shall he do, and greater works than these. Because they go to my Father. An unlimited, an unlimited realm of God's grace and goodness. Here's what Jesus said. The Holy Ghost would come to us. John chapter 16, verse 12 through 13, 14 and 15. The Holy Spirit would come to us and he would take everything that belongs to Jesus. And everything that belongs to Jesus is that which the Father has. So he's going to take everything that belongs to the Father and he's going to reveal it. He's going to transmit it. He's going to disclose it to you and me. He, God has given to us a place to stand in Christ Jesus that defies all the imagination, that defies logic. He's given to us a grace so that you and I, even though we've had all of our failings and all of our problems and all of our sins and we come from, great, uh, from a great place of darkness and deception in, and, and now having been born again and brought into this marvelous light, He's put us into a place where we'll, also, where we'll even judge the angels who never sinned. I mean, it just defines the imagination. All that he's done for us. And Satan wants to constantly, and religion wants to constantly, place us within a limitation of our own human ability. Out of those things which we can uh, achieve and those things which, which we can strive to do. You have to just rise up out of that mess and believe what God says in his word. Huh? Come on, I hear we talk all the time about... Some thorn that Paul and the flesh. But why, why don't I hear him talk about Romans 15, 19, how the, Paul described how it was, what he, his definition of preaching the gospel was. His definition of preaching the gospel was to go everywhere with signs and wonders and the power of the Holy Ghost. With authority to turn people from the power of Satan to the power of God. God gave him authority to understand that Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. He's just looking for somebody to agree with him. He's looking for someone to believe it. Because God's going to bring his solution and his remedy to a suffering, dying, tormented world in darkness through those who have been willing to be participate with this so great a salvation and be his sons, and be his heirs and the joint heirs of Christ. Those who are willing to move in the power of redemption, the authority of faith, the baptism in the Holy Ghost and power. The Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost and fire. God's looking for somebody who will agree with him. You know, I was, you've heard me say it almost every night since I came back. I'm going to say it again. I was in Tokyo, Japan. I was looking at the condition of, of, of the church there. I was looking at the great buildings that had been built by men. Looking at the great wealth and the great accomplishments of that nation. And then seeing the church, you just totally hidden. I said, Lord, you look very, very small here. Lord, the gospel obviously has no power here. I was, in great dis I was in great distress about the whole thing. Where is the authority of the gospel in this place? Has no one with the power of God come and liberated this nation? And the Lord came and visited me about 5 o'clock in the morning. 
And he said, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. I'm just looking for somebody to agree with me. He made it personal. Mark, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. I'm looking for someone to agree with me. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And the very next thing, it says, go. <laughs> go preach. Go declare this word. Go declare this gospel of the kingdom. Where is that going to start? It's because it's going to start tomorrow where you are at in the, in the framework of where you are at. You don't, you, what do you do for lunch? Then tell me about how your job has preeminence over You can't preach the gospel because of your job. Get rid of your job. Don't tell me you can't preach the gospel because you got all this and all that and all the other thing. The Lord says you're not worthy of me. That's what he said. I'll bring it to the context. If you need, if you needed to tonight. I want you to stop making excuses and start obeying. I want you to start going and preaching the gospel. I'm telling you right now, when you begin to make souls your number one purpose in life, it begins to straighten the things out in your life that you've not been able to recognize. It begins to fix the problems. It does. It begins to fix the problems. I'll show you people who are set free and full of joy. They're the ones going in the highways and the byways reaching people. They're the ones taking their lunch break. And as soon as they get off work, they can go find some time, reach the lost. They're going to go every place looking for somebody who needs salvation. They've got enough forward that they've got fire in their lips and in their tongue. Huh, they got a river coming up out of their innermost being. They got the word of life coming here, right here by the Spirit of the living God to set the captives free. Amen. Come on now. Don't be afraid. Don't let fear and intimidation stop you. Miracles will work great in the street. Miracles will work great in the highways and the byways. They'll work great in your workplace. It won't take you long. Somebody believe that you're real. That you really know God, and they're gonna lay hold on you, and they'll come to church with you every time you pick them up. That's the way it works. That's how it works. Huh? You can't take a hold of the fire of God and the glory of God. I know what happens. You can tell me what happens when you get in touch with the fire and the glory of God. I know what happens. People begin to get saved. People begin to be transformed by the gospel. They begin to be impacted by His grace. Huh? And then they're gonna watch every move you make. Just like a child watches its parents and learns from its parents. And there better not be a bunch of, you know, disconnect and unreconcilable issues. Otherwise, their faith will be overthrown. Can you hear what I'm saying to you tonight? I pray in Jesus' name that you'll be able to hear. Let me just stop off at Romans chapter 8, verse 17, just so that you get this just before I go on. Is there anybody here in the place tonight, you sick and tormented? Anybody sick and tormented? Huh? You sick and tormented? I know about the torment. You better watch out. Things that you sow into right now, you're going to reap later. You watch out. You watch out. People think that they can sow. They think they can sow the flesh and not reap corruption. God said, I'm, you're not mocking me. You're not going to mock me. You're not going to tell me my spiritual laws don't work. You ain't telling me my spiritual laws don't have consequences. You better watch what you're sowing. I've stood in this place and I've talked to parents over the years and I've said, by the Spirit of the Lord, my veins popping out of the side of my neck, you're going to lose your kids. You quit acting the way you're acting, you're going to lose your kids. And they just thought I was mad at them. I wasn't mad. I was prophesying to them by the Spirit of the Lord. They wouldn't listen. I had no ears to hear the Spirit of the living God speak. Huh? I've said to people, look, you're at the crossroads. You're about to be removed out of this place by the living God. You're about to be moved out. Unless you get right with God, unless you repent of the deeds of your heart, you're going to be moved out. And they got moved out. And, they did, and what has happened, the deception, they believe it's their own decision. No, God picked them up and moved them out. We speak to you by the Spirit of the Lord because we're here in the midst of a place where the wind of the Holy Ghost is blowing right now on the threshing floor of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the wind drives the chaff away. God's giving every man a space of time to repent. People just think, well, it's, it's just, well, this is where I go to church and I'm going to be faithful. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with a place that God's assembling people together to go everywhere preaching the gospel of the kingdom so that the, so that the, the, that the masses don't die and end up in, a, in eternity without God. 
so that somebody will somebody be raised up so that others might have an encounter with the living God. I don't care how big churches are. My issue is, are they, have they been born of the Spirit or have they been born into religion? Have they been indoctrinated into the kingdom of God or indoctrinated into the traditions of men? It's a big issue. It's a big, it's a big issue to me. And the only thing that's going to show the difference and make a distinction between the two is the fire of God. The fire of His presence and His glory. I know the fire of God will fall upon this church. I know the Father's purpose for His fire to fall upon this church in a radical way. But the offering's got to be perfect. And the offering needs to be in, the way for the offering to be perfect is for every man to have their life hid in Christ Jesus because he's the only perfect offering. But the Lord has empowered us to be able to, to offer our lives a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. God has made a way so that you and I could step into this offering that Jesus Christ gave for us. And, and there find ourselves crucified with Christ, buried with him by baptism into his death, raised up together with him, alive together with him, seated in the heavenly places with him, that the fire of God and the presence of God and the fullness of all of his glory might rest upon us and fill us in every dimension of, 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 of those things that he himself possesses. That's what God says. He said, if we, if we, he's purposed that you and I come to know the height, the breadth, the length, the depth, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, and there in that place be filled with all his fullness. Now unto him who is able to do super abundantly above all that you can think or ask, according to the power that is at work on the inside of you. Huh? For you to believe that Christ Jesus has not come into your life, for you to believe that somehow... It's, it, it's, he's, he, you, are, you are other than him and, 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 and somehow he's displaced from your life. My goodness gracious. And that you're trying to serve him the best of your ability is to believe another gospel. The gospel that we are taught of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, is that Jesus came into our life. He's living on the inside of us right now. He's come to dwell on the inside of us. We live in him and he lives in us. Our whole life and our whole identity is supposed to be in Him. It's something that He's given to us as a free gift. We're not trying to overthrow the position of God. That's nuts. That's a lie right out of hell. That's people trying to invalidate the things and overthrow the things that Jesus said. And nobody's, no man's calling himself God or equal to God. We got something better than that. We are we, in that place of being those that are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, made one with him because he's given to us the gift of salvation. Come on. He's come to dwell on the inside of us, and we've come to dwell on the inside of, uh, on, in him. And, the, and our whole purpose of living is to do the same thing that he did, to do his works. That's our whole, that's our whole purpose. That's everything that the, that the Holy Ghost is leading us and guiding us to do. I want you to look with me in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 17, real quickly. Scripture says, and if children, then heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. If you are sons, in other words, if you sons, ready, we're sons, right? As many as received him for who he is, he gave them the authority to be sons of God. As many as it would believe upon his name. Beloved, now are you the sons of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Beloved, now are you the sons of God. At this very moment, heirs with Christ. Join, heirs of God, join heirs with Jesus Christ. Having received everything that belongs to him because the Holy Ghost is taking all that he has and brought it to us. In an unlimited realm. You're going to tell me that rivers of the expression of the Holy Ghost flowing out of your life is limited? What? What? God's description is rivers of living water. This spake of the Holy Ghost flowing out of our life. That is the unlimited expression of the goodness and the graces of God that he's given to us as a free gift and calls for all men to come and drink of this salvation. The reality of it is, as I've watched so many times, people have left the truth. God has brought them into a place to prepare them to be able to participate in the great outpourings of the Holy Ghost and the great movings that the Father has planned for this life. And they've allowed Satan to deceive them and sort them out. And they was driven away by the wind of the Holy Ghost like chaff is driven from the threshing floor. And now they become the biggest enemies of the gospel. 
They become the biggest enemies of these things that we preach. I can name people, even people that were once in this church, who become enemies of the gospel. They, they want a life that, that they can live religiously. They don't want the power of God demonstrated with the authority that Christ Jesus has purposed for us to walk in. It's a sad thing. My heart's broken over it. And I certainly don't want it to be you. But if you sit around and don't do anything with these, anything with these things that God has said, you could, you could also run the risk of ultimately being deceived. Because you become discouraged, you become disappointed, and you go, my, why aren't these things working in my life? Things aren't working in your life because you're not doing anything. You're not going anywhere. You're not taking any risk. You're not obeying God. You're still hanging on to your past problems. You're still hanging on to your sickness and to your human affairs. You're going to have to start grabbing a hold of a good confession, start declaring how you healed, how everything about your life is filled with the goodness and the glory of God. <laughs> I dealt with, the, I dealt with a, a disease in my body. I didn't tell anybody. And um, the only person I knew was my wife. I gave, I gave it not one moment of recognition, not one moment of recognition, that every one of my joints were in such pain that if I bent down for, and it was for a number of years, if I bent down to pick up something, every joint in my body screamed with pain. I give not one place to it. I did not recognize it. I, I refuse to accept any part of it. I, thought, I thank God every day for the fact that I lived in divine health. I, I, I do not have one little trace of those ache and, aches and pains today. That disease that has tried to take a hold of so many people, that joint disease, that pain, tried to lay its hands on me. I found that all I need to do is start worshiping God and praying in the Holy Ghost, and I got right, I'll just push right through the pain. It didn't have any dominion over me. People, we all, take, we all face challenges. You know, you can say that many are the afflictions of the righteous. But you must also say that the Lord delivers us out of all of them. And he don't need the doctor. And he doesn't need the medicine cabinet. Huh? He just, are you going to stand there? Are you going to push through to that place that God has for us when you've got a whole army standing in front of you saying you can't do this? You've got a whole army uh, of, of the powers of, def, of darkness trying to defy the will of the Father and the purposes for, what you, for which you were redeemed. What are you going to do? Are you going to capitulate? You're going to just lay down? You're going to give up? Or are you going to fight a good fight of faith? I'm going to fight a good fight of faith. I'm going to say what God's... I'm going to be valiant. I'm going to say what God said is true. And I'm going to stand here and I'm going to declare the Word of God even though the circumstances and situations say it's different. I'm going to say, no, it is not different. This is the way it is. Huh? Come on now. Amen. Amen. And I tell you, there's probably nothing more important than you and I taking a hold of our identity in Christ, our oneness with Him, our airship with God, for us to be able to move forward in the things of God. There's probably nothing, nothing singularly more important than that. To know this love that Father has for you. Father loves me so much, Jesus said, He's going to show me all things. That he himself is doing. I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. Romans 8, 17. Is that, when I said that, a cloud of glory just came over my whole being. <laughs> Why? Because I believe that. I believe that. It is his word and I believe it. It is not something that is distant from me, aloof from me, something that belongs to somebody else. It's the love letter directly to me. It's my inheritance. I inherited these things not because of anything that I've done, not any works of righteousness when I've done. I've inherited these things because it's Christ Jesus' inheritance and I find my whole life in him. He's my whole salvation. He's my whole holiness. He's my whole righteousness. He's my whole acceptance to God. I have nothing outside of him. I don't even exist outside of him and neither do you. You dead outside of him. He that hath the Son has life. He that hath not the Son has not life. That means you're dead. Huh? Is that true? That's 1 John 5, 12. For those of you who don't know it. Hallelujah. I got Jesus. I have Jesus. He's mine. Huh? Because that's what the Scripture says. He that hath the Jesus. It's a personal possession. I have him. He's mine. He belongs to me. He's mine. And I'm his. And he made it so. 
It wasn't anything that I did. It's his gift, his grace, his goodness, his love. And tradition and religion and the powers of darkness are going to try to strip that away from you. At some level. If they can take it all, they'll go take it all. If they can just take a little part of it, if somehow they can make some kind of distinction between you and God. That's what religion does. It wants to make God a transcendent other. That's a theological term. It's a wild theological term. Literally, transcendent other means that he is completely different from you. He's away from you in another location. And by the help and the grace of God, someday you may be able to touch him. And he has given you access, but it's just a little bit. Do you believe that gospel? I don't believe that gospel. Do you believe that gospel? I don't believe that gospel. But unfortunately, it, it lies behind, and good word, it lies behind many of the, the denominations, traditions, and belief systems. He was other than I am. I was other than him. Now I'm one with him. At one time, I was alienated with, from him by wicked works. But now he's in me and I'm in him. Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand the power of faith that is here? When you're feeling sick, when you're feeling worried, when you're feeling distressed, when you're feeling overwhelmed? Do you understand? Do you understand? Do you understand? Understand? That it changes everything yes. when you recognize that Christ Jesus is present. Did I read Romans eight seventeen? Yes. Let me read it again. Amen. If you children, then you're heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, and so be that we suffer with Him, we shall also be glorified together with Him. Amen. Now. I want you to look with me in John chapter 5. I'm going to start at verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for what things soever the Father does, even so the Son does likewise. Verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he's doing and will show him greater works than these so that you can be astonished. Now I want to just understand a number of things here. The beautiful thing of it is his Father was showing everything that he himself was doing to Jesus, not because Jesus loved him and he did, but because Father loved Jesus. Showing him everything that he was doing. Everything that Jesus did wasn't out of his own independent will. It wasn't because he decided to do it. It was a dependency upon the Father. It was, out, it was doing those things that Father was doing. In fact, it's Father's desire. It's fundamentally Father's desire to heal you right now. It's fundamentally Father's desire to bring you to an, into a place of oneness with himself so that you have all power and authority over everything that Satan is doing so that nothing that Satan is doing has by any, any means the ability to hurt you or harm you, has no authority over you in any way. Everything that belongs to that category. God loves you so much. Huh? He loves you more than you love your children. How much do you protect your children? Huh? If you know that the mountain lions are in the area and then that the big, you know, Bears and grizzlies and whatnot have moved into the neighborhood. Are you going to let your child run around out there in the dark? I wouldn't let, I wouldn't let my child run around in the, the dark. Huh? Just go, I'll go ahead and just go out there and play. And then play with the mountain lions and the bears. You're going to expose your, your children to destruction. You're going to expose, expose your children to those who would come and steal them away and take them into slavery. Sell them into a life of death and destruction and prostitution and thievery and make assassins out of them and all the rest of the stuff that goes on in this evil and wicked world? Of course not. Father loves us so much more. Say, so if you love your children, 
You give good gifts to your children. You, you, how much more is your Heavenly Father going to give you the kingdom? How much more is your Heavenly Father going to give you good things? How much more is your Heavenly Father going to give you the Holy Ghost? How much, how much more is the Father going to protect you? How much Father going to give you freely all things? Freely all things, not freely some things. Freely all things. Say freely all things. Freely all things. Not freely some things. I'm not going for some things. I'm going for all things. Religion says I can have some things. Maybe the leftovers, maybe. Maybe the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I'm up at the table. I'm up at the table. I'm not eating crumbs. Amen. Hallelujah. Even though a, a single crumb will do. Even though a single crumb is all that you need to get to remedy and salvation to your house. Even though a single crumb. If your daughter was possessed with the devil like the Syrophoenician's woman, woman's daughter was, you'd be upon your face crying out to God. But how about your daughters being subjected to all the things that go on in the education system? Are you on your face crying out for them? Are you having revival in your house? Are you having a Holy Ghost meeting that's focused on them? Are you, are you touching heaven on a daily basis in your house so that each, each person in your house is filled with the strength and the ability to overcome all the wiles of the devil? I trow not. It's not happening. I can see it's not happening. It needs change. It needs change. Are you having Holy Ghost meetings every day in your house? Yes. Good. And you got Miss Busybody <laughs> yes. right down, sit right down in the middle of it. <laughs> yes. Amen. Because, um, huh? Yes. That's what you have to do. Hallelujah. God's giving you an opportunity, parents. Listen, I'm not really allowed by the Holy Ghost to go where I wanted to go tonight. In John 19, in John 5, 19, 20. I'm going to go where he wants me to go. God wants you to raise up prophetess and prophets in your house. Not religious people. God doesn't want, God's not impressed that you're going to raise up a bunch of folks that are brilliant. I want you to raise up people on fire, hungry and thirsty for the things of heaven. Lay hands on the sick and cast out devils. Whose sole purpose is to reach the lost. If your life is not filled with compassion over the lost, there's something going on. There's a problem with your relationship with the Lord. I want, I want, to, I want you to understand this. In John 14, 9, Jesus said to Philip, even though the Father is very distinctive from Jesus and that Jesus is subordinate to the Father, that the whole will and the purpose of Jesus Christ, the only God-man. How are you listening to me? Yes. I'm not talking about... You, you never, nobody ever heard me talk about God's people being a God-man. Just forget about it. My identity is in Christ Jesus and that's good enough for me. My identity, God never called me a God man. He called me a son. That's all I want to be. Are you listening to me? Yes. I'll need some title that's not in the Bible. I'm in Christ Jesus and he's above all things. He's got all power and authority and that's good enough for me and that's where it's at. So, are you with me? Uh -huh. Hallelujah. He said, for you to see me is to see the Father. What was Jesus saying? He said, I'm doing what the Father is doing. I'm doing the deeds of the Father, and because I'm doing the deeds of the Father, I'm doing His works. It's not, it's not me that's doing the work. It's the Father that is doing the work in me. And because the, I am doing the deeds of my Father, for you to see me is to see the Father. Well, we, here's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, for me to live is Christ. He said, Christ is, he says, Jesus is manifested in my mortal flesh. Our, the, the call that we have right now is to live this life of Christ Jesus in such a way that Jesus is glorified and Jesus is revealed. And for you and I to have Jesus Christ revealed in us, Paul said that God chose that his son, he said his son, Christ Jesus, should be revealed in him. God's chosen to reveal his son, Christ Jesus, in you and me. If Jesus is going to be revealed in our life, then you and I are going to have to be willing 
to do the deeds of the Lord Jesus Christ, even as he did the deeds of the Father. Jesus said, you can do nothing without me. But just before he said that, he said this. Just as he said, the Father does the work, the Father will show me greater works that you may be astonished. He takes it all the way to the point and builds it all the way up to the purpose of saying to you and me, these works which I do. Now look, he says in verse 9, I'm revealing the Father to you. To see me is to see the Father. It's the Father. These are the works of the Father. It was the Father that was doing the works. Now, these works that I do, shall you do also greater works than these. So who's being revealed? Well, Christ Jesus is being revealed. But ultimately, the Father is being revealed because it's the Father's will. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. That who should ever believe should have everlasting life, which is a quality of life, as much as it is a quantity of life. Come on, people. Listen, let's not bear false witness against the Lord. Let's take a hold of this eternal life. Let's start getting happy. Let's get joyful. Let's, get, let's start participating with God. You want to you have the things of, that, the, that the Word of God describes that we're to, to have by the Holy Ghost? Let's start participating with the Holy Ghost. You want to have more joy? Start participating with joy. Have more love? Start participating with love. Somebody said, how do you do that? Walk around and hug everybody. Start there. Everyone wants to get all complicated. And the Lord said, uh, people talk to me about, it. oh, yeah, the Lord's telling me change. Yeah, he is. Don't you change. Smile. Not move to Japan or ever see somewhere or change churches and whatever. He wants to change the way you do things. He wants to start doing it like he does it. When Jesus be revealed in your life, you have to start doing the deeds of Jesus. Jesus says, without me, you could do nothing. You know what he was saying? When Jesus said that in John 15, 5, you know what he was saying? He's telling us in John 15, 5, he's telling us that he wants us to live the very life that he's living, to have the very fruits that he, that he had, to do the works which he did. But he's telling us also that without him, we can do nothing. Now, I'm going to deal with suffering. I'm going to deal with pain. Al, it's good to see you, buddy. Glad you're here. I'm going to deal with affliction, torments right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, I commend them to leave your body. I commend them to go, through, for, go from you. Right now, in Jesus' name. Right now, I break the affliction off your house. I break the affliction off your house right now, in Jesus' name. I break the affliction of your house right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask you to shine the floodlight of heaven down upon the situation with Scott and Marlene so that they can clearly see the problem, clearly see the issue, so that they can deal with it after the Spirit, so that this stronghold, this deception that's come in, try to plague their house, be broken. Right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray right now that be people begin to be so burdened for her need to so their fast and pray for her, not just John. I wonder why. Right now, in the name of Jesus, this show could be broken. I'm going to say this. There's a couple of things I, I want a couple of people to testify about. I'm going to say this about Geneva and, and other people that I know. People of the Spirit. Things started going on in her house. It wasn't right. You know what she did? She fasted and prayed till the yoke was broken. Huh? There was yoke on, 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 on little David's house. She didn't see him in her church for a long time. Now look where he's at. Why? Because mom went to fast and praying. With a th when you got authority with God, you'll break that yoke. You'll break it. What are you going to do? Stand around and counsel it? Or are you going to break it? You're going to reach to heaven, take a hold of the authority of God. You'll break off the yoke. You'll break it. You'll break off the yoke. You try to do it with the arm of flesh, all you're going to do is mess things up. You're going to try to constrain people. you mess things up. You hit your knees. You start crying out to God. You start fasting and praying. You'll break off the yoke because it's nothing but a demon power. That's all it is. Demon power goes. And your daughter's set free. Now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, take this thing now. Take this thing. Turn it around. I wanted, I was so wanted Heather to be able to share tonight. And uh, let me get this microphone here. I, want, I wanted Heather to be able to share tonight with you 
um, something that just recently happened in her life, and I'm so excited about it. Uh, I think it was not last Sunday, maybe it was the last Sunday. Sunday morning, different people started being healed. Um, when I just had everybody raise their hand and receive, they said receive, receive, receive. People, different people started being healed when I was saying that. And um, actually her sister-in-law who had an arm that had probably a rotator cuff torn, who wasn't able to use her arm, her arm totally got healed. Katrina, she came up, you know, you saw the glory of God on her. The Lord touched her, totally healed her. Well, Heather had basically not been able to use her arm properly for a year. And similar kind of thing, just worse, probably a rotator cuff, probably. And she, she couldn't even lift her hand when I said lift your hands. And she just grabbed hold of it. She said, now listen, I'm not going to come under this thing anymore. I'm going to take a hold of faith and I'm going to start declaring those things which God says it's, it's done for me already. I thank you, Lord, that my arm is already healed. She applied the word of God to her life. And as soon as she began to, arm came up a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, and then it's totally healed. Huh? So did anybody lay any hands on her? She got a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Huh? We supposed to go lay hands on everybody else. Huh? Not have to stand in line, get, you know, God's people stand around laying hands on one another. My goodness, go lay hands on the lost. Go lay hands on the lost. Go out there laying hands on the lost. Go out there and find some people and say, listen, are you going through some tough times right now? I just want to bless you. Can I bless you? Can I bless you? I have authority from heaven to bless you. Some people don't like that. Just say, go, go out there and start blessing folks. Got to get them to repent first. No, go bless them first. <laughs> Hallelujah. Huh? That's what Jesus did. He didn't, look, he was getting people healed. There was signs, wonders, and miracles taking place before he made any commitment. As a result, some people's hearts were changed. You know, he healed 10, 10, cleansed 10 lepers, right? Of course, they believed on him to some degree, obviously, because they came to him for healing. But only one came back to worship him. He gave freely, expecting nothing in return. Isn't that good? Listen, tell everybody, tell everybody what happened for you. I was a extremely burdened and extremely struggling with something that kept coming back over and over and over. And one day the Lord gave me a word directly to me. I was a verse. And that verse, as soon as I heard it, completely set me free. But then the struggles came back and I continued to wrestle with it over and over. And the night before this past Thanksgiving, I had sought the Lord desperately and I cried and prayed and cried tears and prayed and God, please help me, God, please help me. And I did that over and over. I did everything I could think to possibly do. And um, got up in the morning, did the same thing before I was supposed to go meet my family, just crying and you know, praying, Lord, help me. And the Lord reminded me of the verse he gave me before. And, um, and as, soon as, I, as soon as that verse came back to my spirit, I remembered, I just, by the Lord's grace, chose to put all my attention on that one verse. And instantly, everything that I had been praying and crying out for, for hours and hours and hours, instantly the miracle happened when I just remembered that verse and accepted it. Okay. It's really the big, it's the big transition. It's hearing the word of God and then hoping that it's going to happen someday. And, and, and de desperately begging God, oh God, can I please have this? Instead of understanding, he's already given it. It's yours. Would you please? It's already yours. It's like, you know, Christmas is coming up. You hand your, your child or the, your loved one a gift. And they're standing there looking at you. Oh, can I please have this? <laughs> I just gave it to you. Oh, but please, can I have it? Can I have it, please? You, 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 something's wrong now. <laughs> something's seriously wrong. Okay? You're becoming extremely worried now. You're concerned <laughs> for their mental health. Right? It's yours. It's yours. You need to say it's yours right now. As much as salvation is yours, you need to say everything else is yours. And begin to thank God for it and praise Him for it. Thank Him that you're growing and increasing in faith every day. Hallelujah. Don't weary in well-doing. God's promise that you should reap if you do not faint. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, living God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Adam came in here a couple of months ago, and he was Dark Shadows, Series 2. <laughs> Hallelujah. And now, it's so beautiful, man, I don't see any. I don't see any thing that belongs to the realms of the power of darkness being able to affect him. Right. That's totally true. delivered. That's true. Totally delivered. Hallelujah. Yeah. Totally set free. Yep. Yeah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, mm -hmm. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And then he just he just took right off, being totally set free, and began to put his hand to the plow. Yep. And started getting involved and and helping us take those things that the Lord has given us in ministry and getting them on YouTube mm -hmm. and hitting the streets and preaching the gospel on street corners. Mm -hmm. And all that does is just cause this grace to just go through the roof yeah. all of a sudden. Yeah. I'm, Father, Father is right there in the midst. That's what, that's what, that's what Father is doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's what Father is doing. Mm -hmm. And he showed us what he's doing. Mm -hmm. He showed us in his word what he's doing. You want to do it with him? Yes. You'll find that he's right there with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you go preaching his word, you'll find Jesus right there with you, confirming his word with miracles. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Isn't it wonderful to be right in the big middle of the things that Father is doing? Yeah. Oh, should Father's heart be revealed to you? Mm. Jesus said, no man has ever seen the Father mm -hmm. but the Son. No man knoweth the Father but the Son. Mm -hmm. And whomsoever the Son shall reveal the Father too. <laughs> My, my, my. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God, for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hey, you know, you said, you said that the Lord gave you a revelation and probably take you more than a few minutes to share it. Yeah, I would. So I want you to, I want you to have some time to do that. Okay. This coming Wednesday night. Praise God. But, uh, Let's do it. <laughs> I'm going to say something real quick here. Glorify Jesus. <laughs> Tell everybody what God's doing. Well, God sent his son, and he died, and then he rose again. And that's it. That's all we need. That's it. Just keep your attention right there. You're going to be good. So why is it that you going out and doing what you're doing in the streets? Because that, that's just been on my heart ever since I gave my life to the Lord. Um, I, I had a tremendous time just being out in public and just being able to be, I just felt so overwhelmed with everybody that was lost and the state of everybody around me that didn't know the Lord. And um, you can't really do anything until you've come to terms with the righteousness that God has given to us in Christ Jesus. And when you set your heart and you, you come to terms with the fact that God just loves you and he accepts you, once you've, you've given your life to him and you've repented and you're living in holiness and righteousness and everything else after that is just an act of love, it's incredibly liberating and you, can, you have this boldness to just do what's in your heart, what God has purpose and plan for you to do, and it's amazing to do it. It's absolutely incredible. There's nothing like it. There's nothing more exciting. There's nothing more amazing, and that's just that's all there is to it. The love of God, knowing the love of God is liberating and it's empowering. When you just get, just get over here in this love relationship with Him, you're going to do all things that please the Father. Amen. You are. Amen. Now, once you get ready, I'm just going to go by and lay hands on everybody here in the place. When I touch you, I'm touching you with my hand. But I have Christ Jesus with me right here, right now. He's going to touch you too. And I'm... I'm I prophesy right now in the name of Jesus Christ, I prophesy change in the homes of the people that are here. To where that those that live in your house with you, you guys are going to have prayer meetings, Holy Ghost meetings, where you touch heaven, heaven touches you. And you don't just stop with tongues. Huh? And just everybody sit around praying in tongues. I mean, that's good. Praying in the Holy Ghost is good. Build up yourself in your most holy faith. But when you, if you're praying in the Holy Ghost and you're truly building yourself up in the most holy faith, then that's all, that strength and that buildup is going to cause you to excel in the prophecy and interpretation at a time. So don't stop short of the buildup. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> 
I tell you, you can have a word of knowledge. You can get a word of knowledge if you set your heart on it. If you get up in the morning before you go to work, you get into prayer, you say, Lord, give me a word of knowledge. Father, give me something. Let me see. Lord, right now, let me understand something. Maybe even call a person's name before the Lord. Somebody that's in your workplace. Or, or, or maybe you're just going to leave it wide open. Um, someone that you're going to encounter. Give me a word of knowledge. Show me that person that you want me to talk to and minister to today. Give me the key to their heart. You lay, it, you lay these things before the Lord. You begin to participate with God. And you know that these things are going to happen. That these things are a living reality. That they are purposed for your life. You'll start having them. Huh? Amen. You will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to get, we, as soon as we get this new building, we're going to start it. We're going to start a ministry on one night out of the week or every other week. I haven't decided yet. Called the School of the Spirit. Hallelujah. And we're going to see every one of you get inducted into the School of the Holy Ghost. And School of the Holy Ghost, School of the Spirit starts you getting baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in a heavenly language. Amen. Amen. And then you're going to sit there and you're going to practice speaking in heaven language until you prophesy. And then now you get, then you're going to graduate. Right? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we're going to have you sit there and pray in the Holy Ghost until you get an interpretation of tongues on one night. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And then until you, you're, not, you're not going to get to advance over into the next section until you get an interpretation of tongues. <laughs> Amen. Until you prophesy or something. Huh? And then once that's going on in your life and it's fluent and you've got it and it's a flow, then we're going to take you over to the working of miracles. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. And then we're going to take you out on the street and we're going to find somebody with the worst condition we can possibly find and we're going to make you go over there and pray for them. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Tell a miracle takes place. Hey, this I'll tell you. The Lord spoke to me before I left, said there's a lot of people in here. They truly want to be able to do something more in the kingdom of God. They just, they're stuck. They don't know what to do. Show them. And so I said, okay, Father, I'll show them. You show me what, exactly how you want me to show them. And then the Spirit of the Lord laid on my heart, take them into the school of the Spirit. They, everybody's been brought into the school of the Spirit. The Scripture says in John chapter 14, verse 26, the Holy Ghost shall teach you all things. Hallelujah. He's in his school. He can teach us everything. Amen. 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 <laughs>